Okay. Well, first off, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, a couple of uh, housekeeping details before we jump into um, the discussion. First off, we'll be sharing a uh, YouTube recording of this webinar in a follow-up note with everyone. Um, we'll also reference some tools in this webinar and we'll share them out on the chat box. And then if you have questions as we walk through the presentation, please feel free just to let us know on the Q&A channel. Um, uh, Jillian and our team will keep track of that and to make sure that we try to cover um, questions that apply most likely for everyone. Um, we also want to let you know we hope you and your families are all doing well and that as we enter the home stretch of this most unusual summer that um, your students are well and um, are engaged in some things that are bringing them joy if not distraction. So um, first off, uh, this afternoon's webinar very specifically about understanding the University of Texas at Austin application process. Our team, Lisa, Allison, Jillian and I, Jillian and, I and the rest of our team um, are so excited to work with so many students this year. G Lisa, when she started College Match Point 11 years ago, um, has been working with University of Texas um, applicants for all of those 11 years. The majority of them were not auto-admit students, um, and most often they can apply to competitive majors. And our entire team is proud of the Longhorns that we worked it with, and we're particularly proud that so many of them have thrived or are thriving on the 40 acres. Um, now, um, Lisa, could you start us off by maybe giving us a sense of what UT means when they describe holistic review? Absolutely. Welcome, everybody. So glad that you guys are joining us on this beautiful sunny afternoon. So thank you. So a few things to kind of set the stage as we talk today. I think people are often skeptical when they look at the amount of materials that UT wants from a student. They're skeptical if it's actually reviewed. But our experience is that the UT, what we call holistic, means they're taking a lot of things into account. They're taking grades, they're taking test scores, they're looking at the students' experiences, which is highlighted in their resume. They're taking, they're taking all of that together, um, the classes that the students taken, and they're reviewing the student. And so for those of you who've started exploring, you know, what are working on UT, you'll notice it's a fair amount of work. But what I want to kind of pose to you guys is that there's also so much opportunity in that because you have so much chance to highlight your strengths here because they're really giving you so many avenues to do that. So I believe that the holistic review is a wonderful thing. I'm so happy that UT continues to do this because it's a lot of time to actually do this. So a few myths, people are always like, oh, do they really read all this stuff? Our experience is they read this stuff. So I would take how I answer it seriously. So holistic, this is different than many, many other big state schools. So what we talk about today is really just for UT. So I wanna frame that because typically holistic review is in smaller schools. So I just wanted to kind of add that in. Lisa, many of the students who often apply to a school like UT Austin also apply to an A&M, a Georgia, a Michigan. Could you talk about how UT will review a student's application as different from how a student's application will be reviewed at an A&M or a Michigan? Well, I would say Michigan's maybe a little more similar to UT. A&M isn't near as focused on what the student has been doing. In other words, they're not really, they, they say they don't care if you send a resume. We are gonna talk at length about the extended resume in the UT process. And I would say it's one of the two most important pieces of the application. So I think if I was to say one thing about, two things about the UT process that are really different than other schools, but is number one, this expanded resume where you could go four or five pages really giving detail about what you've done and also be able to really show what you've done in relation to what you want to study. I would say the level of which fit to major, in other words, being able to prove that you are a good candidate for that major is on the probably one of the higher ends that I've seen in colleges when they're reviewing. So I would say those two things are the differences. So it's not just a numbers game. 
A uh, number of folks when they registered for the webinar noted a question around how can I make sure my student's application for business or computer science or engineering quote unquote stands out. And one thing we found over the last 11 years with students is that there's no single piece as important as the expanded resume is, as important sometimes as the major's essay is. It's important to understand that your student is applying and making a case for a specific major. And what will make them stand out is the holistic application itself, not somehow one piece. Even in the state of Texas, where students are auto-admit, there are a number of majors where they have to be read competitively. So what we often say to students is that this is a puzzle piece and that you're putting together a case based on UT Austin's holistic review model. And one last thing I'll add to that before we keep moving is you want it all to fit together. So we'll talk about this a little bit when we talk about essays, but basically we're gonna show the story of the student and what UT is doing is giving you a lot of places to do that. So the easiest and thing we'll probably talk the least about is transcript. Transcript of course is important in all college admissions and UT is no different. What I would say is a little different at UT is that they're really, again, looking for that fit to major. So if you wanna be an engineer, but you have not taken calculus, besides the fact that they have a calculus readiness requirement, that's gonna be an issue. So your transcript, we can't say there's one transcript for the whole huge University of Texas, but if you want to study physics, have you taken additional physics classes? Have you doubled up on sciences? If you want to study English, have you taken creative writing in addition to the other English classes that you have? So your transcript even is going to be looked at in light of that first choice major. Great. Lisa, any things that you're anticipating may be different this year with COVID-19 in terms of students' transcripts? Yes, I think that it is very likely that fall grades are going to be requested. We haven't heard that yet from UT, so I'll be curious to see kind of how that's going to play. But I think in general in college admissions, we're seeing that and I would guess that that's going to be likely here, although we don't know that at this moment. Right. So uh, one of the most common questions this year is around uh, test optional and almost as important how to get a testing slot. Um, University of Texas has declared that students who are applying for fall 2021 undergraduate admissions are not required. Just as a reminder, this is test optional, not test blind. Test blind is the small, small number of schools that have said, even if you submit the scores, we won't look at them. Now, this is for so many students sort of being cornered um, in a situation where they may not have a test score or they may not have a test score that they're happy with, and they're wondering how do I consider and make a choice about whether or not to take the test in the fall. And what we're encouraging students to think of it is at least along three dimensions. First off, on their current score, are they happy with it? Are they committed to prepping? And do they feel like that there is substantial opportunity for improvement? Two, and this is almost harder to get than a cold spot in the Texas heat, is the ability to test. A test slot is so difficult for students right now. And so for some kids, we've heard them this summer really, really frustrated with the ACT website coming down this past week, not being able to get a test date that stands for the SAT. So there is a bit of an anticipation of how possible is it that I'll be able to test this fall? And then finally, and I think this is a consideration that we're seeing on almost a student by student basis, the major choice. Obviously the more impacted or competitive the major, the more a strong test score is an assumed part of that holistic review. We are pointing out to students that they may in fact choose to go test optional when they submit, and then update their or send test scores when and if their test scores improve before that November 1st priority deadline. Um, uh, Jillian, are there any questions that have come in around testing? There are, there are a couple. And I want um, to add one little thing before we jump to those. I do think that if you're not able to get a test score, 
that it is truly test optional. I think what we're looking at in those impacted majors is it's very competitive. So a test score is going to, I mean, a test score all around, if you can get the test score you want, it's going to benefit you. But I wouldn't feel like if you don't have a score, you cannot apply to those impacted majors. So along those lines, Lisa, what SAT or ACT scores would harm a student if they submitted them? That is an absolutely impossible question to answer. Um, and I'll tell you why. Um, we saw a wide, wide range of scores accepted last year, starting at 21 on an ACT and going up. And, and so I think, again, and I'm so sorry, because I feel like we're going to say this over and over and over and over. It's really dependent on a lot of factors. How strong is the student's resume? How strong is the student's test scores? Um, and so we don't have a cutoff, you know, if it's for engineering, I think that's a very different score than if it's, you know, maybe for another major. I wouldn't be afraid not to submit scores if you're not happy with your score. We already saw last year that UT pulled back on their, uh, like, it was clear, except for engineering, business, nursing, what am I missing, Bob? Computer science architecture and some natural biology science. yeah natural biology. sciences yeah, yeah biology that scores weren't a, weren't the driving factor and that's what we hear from our reps at ut as well in those and I, that's what bob was alluding to is in those impacted majors i think the test score becomes definitely a positive i think across the board at ut we saw a lot of test score just being one of 10 factors that wasn't huge. So, um, but there's not, there's no way without knowing the student. And even then I could give a range, but I couldn't give a definite score. And does UT super score? They do not. Okay. And then the last question about testing, if you have taken the ACT already, but you didn't take it with writing, um, can you still submit the scores? even you though you may not be able to take the writing test. Absolutely, you don't need writing at UT, so that's not an issue. And just because someone may be wondering this, you don't need writing at A&M either. So you're, you're fine in Texas without writing. You're pretty much fine almost everywhere without writing. Uh, one question that came in during the registration, Lisa, is um, are the testing bands, the scores that you need to target, substantially different if you're an out-of-state applicant versus an in-state applicant? Oh, great question. Um, I'm having to think on that one. Um, a little bit, maybe a dab higher, but I wouldn't say, because they use a rubric that they're evaluating candidates on. The rubric doesn't change. And we know that outside those main um, majors that, that the test score isn't, you know, it's a tenth of the, of the, you know, it's not a huge part of it. I don't know if it's a tenth, but it's, it's not huge. You know, it's one of many. So um, I don't think so. I just think the competition for the overall holistic review for your out of state um, person is harder. And one more just came in um, for the October SAT. Will scores get back in time for November 1 deadlines? There's a uh, great question. I'm glad you asked that, whoever asked that. So um, they have, I believe it's December 1st. Is that right, Allison? Right, yeah. December 1st um, for your last point to submit it. And I think it's likely we might see that extended. So, but right now it's December 1st. So you've got plenty of time. All right, let's keep moving. We got a lot to cover. Great. Uh, so one of the terms that is most unique to the University of Texas at Austin is fit to major. Uh, it is a simple, simple idea that is complex for so many students. And the idea is this. There are a handful of majors at the University of Texas at Austin that have substantially more applicants than they have seats in lecture halls. Um, and the way that UT has struggled with that is not to build more lecture halls, but to severely limit the admissions for specific majors. This is obviously not the case for a number of liberal arts majors. Um, it's obviously not the case for undergraduate studies, but it is a situation where there are majors and, and students are typically very familiar with this. They're the business, engineering, computer science, biology, natural sciences. 
three things we want to point out to you. The first is that there are more impacted majors now than there were a year ago or two years ago. We have actually seen a substantial growth in the competitiveness of majors like economics, psychology, and communications. These are typically majors where students may have sought to major in that area rather than a competitive major. The second thing around fit to major is that from UT standpoint, they're reading a student with applicable experience related to that major. And that experience isn't just classes that you've taken. It's out of the classroom, what experience do you have that quote unquote, make sure you know what you're getting into. That a student's resume in some ways begins with a case for what activities have they been involved in. Which leads us to the third thing, and that is, this is actually a place where a student really can make themselves stand out. But it is frankly across their high school career. It's not one or two shadowing experiences in August before they submit their application. And it's important that a student be able to say not just what they were involved in, but how they were involved in, and in many cases, what initiative they show. Lisa, I know there are some other things you've seen <clears throat> in both specific majors and then across the majors in terms of fit to major. Well, I think Bob did a great job of laying it out. And I think what we have is something, it's somewhere at the intersection of impacted and competitive, I would say. Um, you know, that there's just some very, very competitive majors at UT. I mean, we're lucky to live in a state where, you know, the business school is incredibly highly ranked, the, you know, the CS, so many of these majors are highly ranked. And so one of the things when you're thinking about kind of broad picture, do I want to be a Longhorn or I'm just going to use an example, or do I want to be a business major? Is it like, which one is the, like, when you're thinking about UT, this doesn't really relate to your other colleges. If you know you want to be an accountant and you're positive of that, then you probably want to fly into McCombs. McCombs takes, you know, a much smaller pool of their, they get a large pool of candidates because it's a great, well-known program. So you have to answer that question as you're entering here. And I think one of the things we really notice with students and families is there's about five majors that everybody thinks are the majors they want. Those happen to be the majors that get so many applications that, it, that it's difficult to get in. Now that absolutely may be the best choice for your student, but it's worth asking the question and exploring the variety of majors. For and a question that always comes up after this, well, if I don't apply into engineering, computer science, nursing, can I easily transfer in? Probably not. Those really competitive majors stay competitive. However, some of them, like there, there's definite, there's a hierarchy here. Engineering, computer science, and business, and nursing are in a class of their own, okay? And so those are incredibly difficult to, to do that with. But what I would encourage you to do is to make sure that you are spending time really digging into UT and what all that they offer in terms of majors and what major might fit best for your student. I would encourage you to look at majors you're maybe not familiar with. Look at minors and certificate programs. For example, if I go back to my business example, let's say you want to be a marketing major. It might be, well, communications has gotten a little more competitive. It's not anywhere in the realm of some of these others. Maybe communications with a business certificate could work for you. You know what I'm saying? Or you want to be a psychology major, but you don't have a lot on psychology, but maybe you have, you know, another major a little, you know, so kind of, what your fit to major is what you've done to date. And if you are truly, truly undecided, and we get these kids that, you know, it's, a, it's understandable. You're, you're not, you know, at the age where you're necessarily going to know for sure. Don't be afraid to go for undergraduate studies, liberal arts undeclared, um, and, and admit that 
but hopefully you still got a resume. You won't make it into EUT if you haven't been doing anything. You really do have to show a variety of interests, okay? So even if you were to choose like an undergraduate studies or liberal arts undeclared, you've still got to show that you have a variety of interests and that you've been involved, as Bob said, which is such an important point, outside of just the basic classroom things. That's really, really important. What did I miss, Bob? To, um, there are two areas where we see this most significantly, and they are um, students asking, are, yeah, I, I want to be in business. Should I major in business or major in economics? Uh, and, and there are a variety of criteria to uh, sort of answer this with. The first, frankly, is what do you want to spend four years studying in college? If you really want to study accounting, and you major in economics, even with a foundation certificate, you won't take a lot of accounting classes, okay? So the, the trade-off is, as Lisa said, I want to be a longhorn, but I may not get the professional launch that I want because of my major, or do I want to be in the business school? Now, Lisa, there are two areas where we tend to see this most significantly. Students who are committed to a business major and students who are interested in the pre-med track. Mm -hmm. uh, Jillian will be sharing our guide to exploring majors as well as the link for the UT Wayfinder uh, website. But Lisa, can you share um, your experience and good practices you've seen students who are weighing, should I be a biology major or a different major? Should I be a marketing major or a different major? Well, I think it starts with, if you have been, if you've known that you want to be a certain major and you've really, in these four years, you've explored it or maybe you explored one major and then you started, oh, you know, in junior year, something really resonated with you and you're sort of all in, then I think that's probably your major. Now, I would look because a lot of you know, if you want to do environmental science at UT, you have five different ways you can do it, I think, maybe four, but a lot. So um, if you want to do psychologies, there's actually about four or five different ways you could do that, depending on what your ultimate goal is. You can't study psychology five times, but usually when you take it apart with students, it's that they want to help people, right? And there, I would say there's quite a few good options for that. So I would say it's like, how firm are you? What I would just caution against, don't make this lightly, this decision lightly, because it is, this is the biggest part of your application. If there's one part that is the biggest part, it's, it's the fit to major. And here's why. They're only looking at one choice. So they ask you for two choices, but unless you're in the top 6%, they're only considering the first choice major. So think about this, it's like rolling a dice and you're in or you're out. So if you go for the most competitive one, now you may be a great fit for that one. So we have students that go for it all the time. I'm not discouraging that. What I am encouraging is a very thoughtful process to determine that, to kind of weigh the pros and the cons for yourself. For example, there may be students, oftentimes students will say to me, well, I want to be a business major and then I'm going to go get my MBA. And I'm like, well, then maybe you don't want to be in business major, you know, because you're, you know, you're going to go on to get your MBA. So just take the whole thing apart a little bit. Um, and we're sort of over focusing on business. We see this a lot in pre-med. Of course, you know, medical schools even say this, that, you know, they're looking for well-rounded candidates. You do not have to major in biology to go to medical school, but that, and there's a lot, there's a quite a few good majors at UT. There's, there's majors in the, in natural sciences and there's majors in liberal arts that'll work. So I think our biggest thing is two things. Number one, take time with this decision. I see kids sometimes just like, oh yeah, I think I'll pick that. And I just go, no, 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 don't do that. And then the other thing is make sure that you have, if, especially if you're going for those very competitive majors, make sure that you have some activity to back it up because that's going to be really important. One other comment on this, um, and then Jillian, please let us know if we have any questions, um, is that uh, UT is very aware of this. And as a result, over the last several years has begun to roll out some really innovative alternatives. 
Um, uh, they have a human dimensions of organizations major in the liberal arts school, which is fabulous for that student who's looking at a major at the intersection of business and psychology. They have a um, entertainment and technology major that's fabulous for that student who maybe wants to be an animator or on the business side of technology and entertainment. Um, the, the Wayfinder site is such a fabulous site that we even share it with students who aren't applying to UT Austin. And for many students, it's August and they're a rising senior, they know their major. It's okay if a student is still trying to decide, but August is the month to make that final decision because it's crucial to be able to make sure that your holistic application tells that story. Uh, Joanne, are there any questions that have come up related to fit to major? No, there are not. Terrific. Great. Uh, so next. Um, oh, we'll actually, uh, sorry, one did just come in. <laughs> Uh, is there a list somewhere of the most competitive majors at UT? I don't know that there's a list. I mean, I can kind of rattle them off to you. Um, engineering, computer science, architecture, nursing. And we saw biology take a huge spike last year and then it was much, much harder to get into. Now, I'm sure there's some other tiny little, like environmental I'm science. Business. But business, business, economics, psychology, those yeah. are also um, amongst the more competitive majors. Yeah. And then there's some small majors. Like, for example, there's environmental science. One of the environmental sciences is only 25 kids. International relations is small. So there's some of them where it's just they don't have a lot of seats. So, um, But I don't think that's published anywhere. I would dig around. For example, today in, in preparation for this, I was digging around on natural sciences. And they actually show you by each each. Um, major in within the College of Natural Sciences, how many kids apply and how many kids are, um, are, are, how many kids applied and how many are actually accepted. So, but they don't have that across the board. And Lisa, can you talk a little bit about how the first, second, and third major works for the top 6%? Well, for the top 6%, I mean, I think that's kind of a bonus for the top 6% is they can be, if they say they don't match their first, they, they chose something and they just don't match it, they'll go to the second one. The whole thing that we said about fit to major, as I think Bob said in the beginning, totally is the same for getting your major in the top 6%. In other words, you have to match it. So if you don't match that major, even though you're in the top 6%, then they're going to look at the next one. Does that, yeah. Okay, I think we need to move forward. Yeah. Great. One of the most, uh, one of the things we pointed to so many times in this conversation of holistic and fit to major is expanded resume. Um, one comment on this, um, as adults, as parents, we almost have to think of the word resume and then not think of it in relation to this document. Um, most folks who have hired individuals look at a UT expanded resume and say, why does my student have a five page resume? And the answer is because UT would like to read their five page expanded resume. So Lisa and Allison, could you talk a little bit about the role that the expanded resume plays in the holistic review process? Absolutely. I'll give a little bit of overview and then Allison is kind of our resume expert. So I'm going to um, let her kind of speak to that a little bit. Um, okay, so the expanded resume, I wish it wasn't called resume, as Bob said, is really a cataloging of all the activities the student has done. It doesn't have to be five pages. Everyone's certainly not. But you should include all the things that you do. Um, so if you are a chef on this side, you know, not like just hobbies, but things that actually have, you know, tangible results. You want to include everything because they're really interested in kind of everything that you've been involved in. UT overall loves to admit active, engaged leaders. So they want to see where you've been involved. And that is a huge part of this process. The other thing that I would say is that um, uh, in terms of the expanded resume is I would consider trying to 
um, put my things that relate to my major, maybe more towards the top. So I'm going to let Allison kind of give you guys some pointers here on majors. On resumes. So, oh, sorry. so <laughs> one of the things that I, when I um, work with our students, when we start talking about resumes, um, I let them know that the, that the expanded resume um, is really the basis of the whole student story. And by that, we mean, who is this student out of the classroom, right? They've got all this data about them, transcripts, test scores maybe, um, but they're really trying to figure out um, who the student is as a person in a group. Um, and so they're looking for indicators to try to get, you know, they can't interview everybody. So they're really trying to get to know. The information from the resume um, also finds its way into the application can also you know, the ideal scenario is that the resume and the essays also kind of work together to give that rich picture of the student. Um, in terms of resume, in terms of activities, I always tell our students, if you're asking yourself the question, I wonder if this counts, the answer is yes. If it's something that you dedicated time to that was important to you, um, it should go on this. And so sometimes it's independent projects. Sometimes it's, you know, sometimes you're not on the football team, but you built a computer. That's interesting. People care about that, right? Because that, in addition to being something interesting, it tells us a lot about that particular student, right? So we let our students know that the time frame we're looking at is before, summer before freshman year, all the way to, the, to when they graduate, right? And so they may have done an activity Lots of our students have, maybe they were dancers since they were three. They can refer to the fact that they've been dancing a long time, but in the actual UT resume, they're going to talk about their experiences as they relate to that time frame in high school. Um, and anything that they're doing with their time outside of sitting in a classroom is something that belongs on this resume. Um, the other piece to think about once kind of the details are um, cataloged in the resume is sometimes in the description, you gotta kind of educate people. We don't know if the reader is gonna understand what a club soccer team does versus a varsity soccer team. So you do kind of have to educate your reader a little bit about, in a club soccer team, I don't practice as often as I do for my varsity soccer team, things like that. But the most important pieces of this resume are in addition to the basics, Say I play soccer, I practice, I play games, I participate in tournaments. Um, I'm also someone who likes to help out the younger players because it's really important for us to have a cohesive team. Those, I kind of call it with our students, like, kind of, you know, their special contributions, their individual contributions that kind of come naturally to them. Those are really helpful things to include and can be really hard for a student to know those things about themselves so that can be a helpful place for parents to say, hey, remember you set up the, the social media for your, uh, for your book club? Those kinds of things that the student may do without thinking are really important uh, to, in, to indicate that level of involvement. And what they show is a word that uh, Bob used a little while ago, initiative. And colleges love initiative. So those little things that that group wouldn't be the same without you, that you gave it your special touch, those are the kind of things you want to make sure that you're weaving in there, you know, uh, it can be really, really helpful. Um, the other thing is, do think about this reader is going through a lot of applications, right? So while they want this little, this long resume, they've got their eye for a few things. And here's one, the first one. Does the student have a background in what they want to major in. So move that towards the top. Is the student a leader? You know, those kinds of things. So when you think about your categories, and you can name your categories whatever you want to name them, then um, think about starting at the top because, you know, we all wear out by the end. So, um, so definitely do that. Unless you have really, really, you know, major awards, I'd start with your activities. So, um, but Allison is right. You want to get those things in there that are really going to show 
kind of what you've done. You need to spend time on this. This is not something you just do in a second. Um, and we do in our, in our guide to UT, we have an example in here and a lot of explanation, but it is a very important part piece of kind of holding a bit, a significant piece of the whole application for sure. One, one comment, um, and then Jillian, let us know if any questions have come up. Uh, we oftentimes hear from students during the summer before their application, what should I do if I'm applying to a competitive major, say electrical engineering, and I don't have any electrical engineering activities on my resume? At this point in August, one of the questions might be, are you committed to attending at UT, or are you focused on being an electrical engineering major? because the absence of activities will likely be a hurdle that it will be difficult to overcome given UT's holistic review. A strong transcript, a strong test score, can't actually overwhelm the fact that you're saying to UT, my first experience of electrical engineering will be when I step on your campus. There are so many schools that have that as part of their charter that is generally not how UT reads applicants. So that age old question, what should I do if I built my resume and I don't have any activities related to my major? If it's August, the answer is you might wanna research other majors. Jillian, are there other questions that have come up related to the expanded resume? And while she's looking for one thing, I'll add on what Bob just said is that last year I worked with a young woman. Um, she hadn't worked with us, but she came after she, she was an auto admit, but didn't get in engineering. She had left off a ton of stuff. So make sure that you're putting everything on there. If you're light, here's a couple of little tips. Have you taken a sequence of engineering court, if we're going with the engineering or psychology or business or health or whatever, have you taken any courses in school? Put them in your resume and, and tell what you did. If you're in one of these medical programs in school where you do clinicals, so there are pieces of coursework. If you're doing independent projects in a computer science class, those kinds of things, go ahead and try to get that on the resume. Maybe you did an independent project. Maybe you were, you know, so it may be, that you, if you're light, one spot to look at is your curriculum and how to give them more detail about what you got there. If you're studying psychology and you're um, an IB student and you're writing the long paper on that, put that in there. So make sure that don't give up on using, if you don't have the extracurriculars, look for in other corners to see where you might have things. Yeah. Now Jillian, sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> um, so one question regarding um, making the major re reflect what, making the resume reflect what major a student is applying to. What if a student is um, applying for undergraduate studies or as an undeclared student, how do you show that fit in the resume? Great question. So I think most of our successful undergraduate studies, and Bob or Allison, feel free to check me on this if you disagree, our students who are active and engaged, right? So they have a fair amount of activity. Um, they, and, and you can tell that they are interested in a lot of things. Like it's obvious, you know, they did, might've done a summer shadowing a medical person and then they did a, you know, business. Like you can tell they're kind of all over the, um, over the map. So in that regard, that's kind of how they need to read. They need to be able to articulate when we get to essays, what those areas are that they're interested in. And hopefully that's going to be somewhat reflected in their, in their resume. But I call them checkerboard resumes. In other words, you, just, you see like lots of little things jumping around, which is not, let's just be clear, that is not unusual for a student this age, just doesn't fit as well with this process, um, is to, those are the students who are going to be able to do UGS and they're going to kind of try to in their essays when we get to that they're going to bring all that together in their essays. Would you guys agree? That's absolutely. I like to say that the undergraduate studies resume reads like an explorer. <laughs> like you just look through like oh and then I found that and there was other thing and so um and you might see a little music and a little science and but what you do see and I would say this is the thread you do see deep curiosity and love of learning for its own sake. That's what I would say just jumps right off those resumes. People that just love to learn because they're curious. Mm -hmm. 
Fantastic. Any other questions? Um, can you talk a little bit about the nuance of when you're filling out the UT application? Um, how do you know, should you be including all of the activities in your resume that you were able to fit in the extracurricular section? Should you only submit the resume? Can you talk about the nuances we'll get, we'll get of that? We'll get to that after essays. Yeah, we'll get to Perfect. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Then we're all set. Terrific. All right, so essay. So UT has one long essay and then three short answers with an optional fourth, okay? So let's just kind of walk through them a little bit. The first one is what is a challenge or opportunity that you've had in high school and, and how did that impact you? This essay could be on almost anything except don't have it be on you as a three-year-old unless you're going to quickly move it to high school, okay? So they wanna hear about you in these four years. Other than that, almost anything can fit the bill. And this is the number one spot where you should think like if someone was sitting down and wanting to get to know something really interesting about me, like something that's not anywhere else, what might they, what might I want to share? Or maybe it is something that is already on your resume or whatever, but I want to tell them what it really meant to me or a moment in it. So it's a snapshot into you. The number one most important thing of a good long essay, which is hard for students, is that it has reflection. So it is set in a story. We often say show, don't tell. But in addition to that, it's a, a story is only the frame. Almost any, one of the best essays I ever read was about cooking with his, somebody cooking with their grandpa. That doesn't sound terribly interesting when I say that. But it was the reflection that he had about cooking with his grandpa that made it a phenomenal essay. So while the topic is certainly important, the topic isn't the number one thing as much as how you're able to reflect on that in the essay, how you're actually able to come out. And I'm like getting to know that person. Um, those are things that I think are really, really important in the long essay. Bob, Allison, y'all want to add anything? One, two, option, two observations on this longer essay. Um, the first is that um, we encourage students to spend a substantial amount of time brainstorming on this essay. Simply sitting down and writing yet another academic essay, honestly, the most important thing is for the student to pull back and to try to really get comfortable writing about themselves distinctively and personally at a level of specificity. And our YouTube channel includes a whole host of videos about brainstorming ideas for a student to utilize. The second is, as Lisa said, the majority of students overwhelmingly who apply to UT will never be interviewed. This essay is the equivalent of what you would say in an interview. It's not the color commentary on your resume. It's not the play-by-play -play of that person who's most important in your life. It is instead a discussion of who you are and what makes you unique or distinctive. We often say to students, you need to write the essay that only you can write. Don't write a better missions essay. Don't write a better COVID essay. Write an essay that only you can write. Allison, you've worked with so many students on their long UT essay. What insights do you see about students who may be struggling with their UT long essay? I find that um, sometimes uh, there's usually two categories of struggle. One is, I don't have any stories. I haven't done anything. That, and sometimes students will say, nothing terrible has happened to me. I'll say, that's, that's, that's good news. We want you to write about something positive. We want you to write about something meaningful. Some students do come to the table thinking that they, they really need to find like the story that is going to just blow the minds of the admissions team. Um, and really what they want to do is know them. The other students feel like they're supposed to be writing a cover letter that is supposed to somehow identify um, all of the major pieces of their resume. And that's also not um, what this essay is for. So I always try to explain to my students that this essay has a special job to do. You have this whole host of, of, of data and information from your test scores and your grades, your resume that shows 
I am someone who can, right? I'm someone who can take AP classes. I'm someone that can get um, these grades and participate in these activities. This essay, we're really trying to help them understand I am someone who, right? And sometimes I'll help my students if they're, figure, if they're thinking of a particular moment, I'll help them think about who were you before that moment? I was someone who didn't realize X. And then after that, I was someone who realized Y. And so really looking for periods of growth and moments of growth can be really helpful. And families can be really helpful to students in kind of reflecting moments where there was learning growth or a shift in perspective, because that's really what makes um, a substantive compelling college essay. Terrific. I think that's a good overview on the on the long essay. So we have four essays here that are going to fit together. One thing that we do with our students is we try to map out what they're going to write about in each one so that they fit together and there's not a lot of overlap. Now every once in a while had a student like this a couple years ago who was just music. Everything was music and that really was his whole life. And so we had a suite of music and it actually worked nicely. Um, but in general, you would wanna highlight different parts. The second essay, probably the most important thing you're gonna write in this whole thing is what, what's your intended major, okay? That's about that first choice major. And it really, think of it like a little bit of a case. You want to major in this. While it is tempting to spend a lot of time saying someone who inspired you to want to do that, or you don't have enough real estate, you have 300 words to convince someone that you are a great match for that um, major. So be careful about using two, and you don't need this to be set in a story, or this is really one thing I love about these short answers. They just want you to answer this question truthfully and honestly, right? And so, and what I would say the biggest mistake I see students making is, you know, they'll pick like, oh, I want to be a psychology major because I like helping my friends. But then you'll pull up their resume and they have six different things they've done related to psychology and they didn't say that. Be sure to illuminate that. So it's not essay regurgitate. I mean, it's not resume regurgitation, but it's telling giving a little more reflection on why you did those things so you might pick your top three things that you've done related to that major and and highlight those but don't leave stuff on the you know make sure that you're really you know going for gold here now you might leave in some coursework if you've had some exceptional coursework something that is really unique to you i wouldn't it, or if coursework's all you have, you're going to need to use that, right? So that's where I might use coursework. But they really are looking for, um, they want to see multiple experiences if possible. So, you know, shadowings, internships, other, you know, other, they want to see that you've taken some initiative to be interested in this. So that could show up in your curriculum, but that's probably also shown up in summers or clubs or something else. What else would you guys add? Allison? I would say one of the things that I, that, I, um, that I help my students think about when they're adding the things they did is how did that like continue to inspire them or interest them in that major? So, so you took that class and then, oh, I didn't know there was this piece of it. And so then I looked into that or I developed a particular skill that actually helped me in this next class that I took when I did that. So to kind of link it together so we can see that process of exploration and then kind of their level of interest and curiosity about that major that kind of took them through that process. Great point. That's a really great point. Fantastic. So that's the major essay. Then we go to the leadership essay. I will say that it is hard to get accepted to UT if you don't have some leadership. It really is. Now let's don't, don't hold on. That could be broad. So leadership isn't just like I was the president of student council. It doesn't have to be that, but they really do want to see engagement. Maybe that's a better word than leadership. Mm -hmm. They want to see that you're someone who's engaged, someone who will jump in. And so, you know, there's a few ways to approach the leadership essay, which is, to really talk about where you've been a leader. And, and some of those could be, I'm a leader in my family. I'm a leader at my church. I'm a leader. So it doesn't have to be 
super classic, you know, what we think of, you know, kind of standard leadership stuff. Also, sometimes you might want to talk about what type of leader you are and then talk about those, you know, hit the beats on, and I've, this has shown up here, here, and here, you know. So, for example, I'm a quiet leader, or I'm, a, I'm the person that, you know, gets all the details together, or whatever it is. Again, this is really answering the question straightforward, you know, but I think students kind of our experience is students bristle at the word leader okay i'm not a leader i know you know almost everybody actually does have leadership so it's that's again another place that sometimes it just needs to invite a conversation and um bob mentioned that um we do have a youtube channel that has a lot of good um videos on that and we have a couple of really good ones on that as well the last one is the hardest, I think, and I'm not even going to remember the whole thing off the top of my head, but it's asking you what experiences you've had. Allison, help me out here. So it asks about um, pers experiences, perspectives, or talents right. that you have and how those will contribute to and enrich the learning environment at UT. It's, so it's a little bit of a mouthful of a prompt. <laughs> um, and so this is, and Lisa, go ahead. So that's the prompt. Oh yeah, thank you. I just, the, the prompt is, we, we laugh that there's four essays in that prompt. Yes. What I really think they're getting at is they want to know how you can work with people who are different from you. Okay, I think that is ideal. Now that's again broad. That could be lots of different ways that you've done that. And what's an experience like that? And then how are you going to enrich the very broad community of UT? Like, what do you, why is that, why is it going to be different if you're there? How's that going to be different? What are the things that you're excited about there that you want to contribute to there? Probably not the place to say you want to join Greek life, even if you do. But, you know, I think they're looking for something, um, you know, a little more um, impact there, if you will. So, um, sorry about that. Apologies. Um, so that I think is very, very important. So um, I would say, make sure that you've got some about UT. I feel like the number one thing that people do is they forget to add the UT part. What else would you add, Allison? So I would say I like to break it down for my students. I say, okay, what is the thing about you as a person that you feel like really would make a classroom a more engaging place to be like what's kind of what is that thing that you bring to a group and then I ask them um, now how would that look in a discussion at UT how would that look um, in the dining hall at UT how would that look so that students can kind of start placing the different ways that quality might contribute for example, if someone's a really outgoing person, I really want to see that person in the dining hall when I don't have anyone to eat with, right? Like, and so, um, and so I like to help them think of, place themselves in that environment and talk about like, okay, you're in a class, it's the first day of class and there's all these people sitting there, they don't know each other, they don't know each other. Who are you in that group? Are you the really good listener that's gonna make sure that, wait, this other person hasn't spoken in two days, maybe I'm gonna ask them a question to engage them in the conversation. So I really try to get the students to think specifically about the different, the different aspects of their lives at UT and how they'll be a contribution. Absolutely. So then if we think about, we've now got this whole mosaic, right? We've got this personal story about you. We've got your major, we've got the leadership, we've got how you're gonna enrich the community. They're getting to see a lot and we've got that long resume. That's a lot that they're getting to see and learn about you. And that's why I call it an opportunity because I think it really is quite a lot. The fourth essay that I just want to briefly mention is there is the opportunity to talk about additional information. So let's say that um, the family, you know, maybe whether there's a divorce in the family or an illness or someone lost their job or we, you just moved or anything that might have impacted the student, a great spot to talk about that is in that fourth additional information. Now we don't use it that often. I guess we use it in about 25% of the cases. I wouldn't only use it if you have something to really add. And if you do use that, be sure that you end it on a something you learned and how you're going to, you're ready for college so that it doesn't leave a kind of hanging, oh, is the student ready for college? But what admissions people tell us is answer the question, if you got an F in a class, 
You know, if you, if you had one taint semester, tell us why it was, because they would like to know that. And then tell us what you learned from that. So again, it's short, about 300 words, but I wouldn't hesitate. I feel like students should be very comfortable to use that if they need to use that. And that's the suite of essays. Jillian, are there any questions that have come up regarding essays? One, um, so in the first short answer about intended major, what if a student is planning on minoring or being part of a certificate program? Is that a place to talk about that? Absolutely not, um, which is kind of crazy. And let me just say only at UT because in many other colleges, possibly yes, for sure. Because you have such a short amount of time to talk about, um, about the major and the fit to major. You really want to stay 100% on point. And that's that first choice major. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Those are all we have. It looked like I thought I just saw one come. No. No? OK, great. All right, fantastic. All right. Oh, sorry. There are, there are a couple. They're coming in. OK, that's what I thought. <laughs> coming in. Um, can you talk a little bit about how students can express the impact of COVID-19 on their summer activities, their attempts to take testing? Is that additional information, um, that fourth short answer, a place to talk about that as well? You could talk about an additional information. I would be careful. If you experience something that is really going to be very different from other people, I would put it there. They're, they're aware of, we can't get a testing site in Austin, da, 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 you know. So if it's something that they would, you know, if you yourself were sick, if a family member was sick, something like that, I would. If it's kind of the standard obvious that, that lots of people do, then I wouldn't worry about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, they know that you can't get a testing date. Um, those kind of things, I would not put that in there. But if you actually had something in your family that was really, really impacted, then I absolutely would put it there. And there Other was a questions. question that was about essay length. Um, on all of the prompts, there's always a, a, a maximum word count. So for the longer essay, I think Apply Texas will allow you to do 700 words. We usually tell our students to kind of shoot for 650 because then it's an easier to use in other applications. The short answers are a max of 300 words. Right. And one thing that I will say is the long essay, there, there's, there's a belief on the street that it can only be 650 words. It can actually go as long. And as we, I think 650 words is just about a right length or even a little less can be right. But just so you know that it's not a, oh no, my, my essay's 10 words over, what am I gonna do? You're okay. Now, when you get to your common app schools, that will actually be an issue. So know that, but so, Another great thing about UT is the honors programs. There are phenomenal options for honors programs. They change a little bit every year. Um, probably the most popular one that people are super familiar with is Plan 2. And so Plan 2 is an interdisciplinary program, um, very competitive. And it's really for that student that's interested in a whole lot of different things. Now, when a student applies into plan two, there's, there's a myth on the street that you absolutely need to put plan two as your number one major. Don't do that. Don't do that. Because you need to have your number one major needs to be the major you want to major in, in case you don't get into plan two, okay? So in your short answers, stick with the major that you've listed. Usually, it's a liberal arts major. You can apply to plan two from natural sciences, engineering, or business. It's but the vast majority of the students in the program will be coming from liberal arts. Um, and UT has wonderful resources online for these honors programs. So I really encourage you to explore those. And I guess we haven't said this throughout, so it's a good time to say it. Reach out to UT if you have questions. We have many, many students that will talk to the people in the honors programs, email with them. They're, even though it's a large university, they're pretty responsive. Um, you know, of course, COVID makes things a little bit slower, but, um, but definitely do your homework here because there's so many great honors. So in liberal arts, we have plan two, 
which is a major that can sit with another major, okay? And that's a little hard to explain, and there's great videos on, on UT's website. It is very competitive. You, for all the honors programs, you're gonna have to write another little essay, it's of 250 words-ish, and you know sometimes a couple other things, but it's not a lot of extra work. Liberal arts honors is a little bit less selective liberal arts honors program. So you can apply to that. Yes, you can apply to both of those. That's not true in all the colleges, but you can apply to both the honors programs in liberal arts. Those are, that's probably the most popular one we get. I would say the second most popular one, well, a lot of our students will apply to business honors. There's a wonderful honors program in the business school, so you can apply to that. Um, that's one of the few spots where they do typically call you for an interview. So one of the few spots at UT where they're actually gonna likely ask you to interview if you kind of make it through that first round. And don't get worried, that's usually not until late fall. So lots of times kids are panicking, I haven't gotten the interview, and it just takes a while. Um, and then the natural sciences has three different honors programs. You choose one of them. They're all a little bit different. So you really need to do your homework on them. And by do your homework, you might try to like set up a phone call with um, a person because that one has three really distinct programs. You know, most of our kids in liberal arts, many will apply to liberal arts honors. Some will apply to plan two, some won't apply to any, um, but Though, but with the with the natural sciences, you've really got to do your homework on, on which one you want. And, and that's important. Uh, there's also communications honors, there's the Turing scholars, there's lots of honors programs. And the way that all of them work is that you are going to usually have to write another short essay on it. Is there anything else, Allison, you'd add about honors programs or Bob? Well, I would say one of the things that um, students have had a lot of success with um, this summer um, and maybe it's because it's just so hard to get on campus and talk to people, but the departments are really happy to connect you with students in those programs to talk about what they're like. And so if you call Plan 2 and say, I'm trying to decide between Plan 2 and Liberal Arts Honors, they'll let you talk to a Plan 2 student who can tell you, this is what it's like for me, and this is what I enjoy about it. And, you know, so they'll, they're really giving a lot of access to kind of direct experience in those programs, which I think, which I think is pretty valuable. Absolutely. So I would say use the resources at UT. They are really great. They're very willing. I, I would say that I should have probably said that at major too. If you're down to two majors and you want to know some information about it, call the department, talk to them. They're very, they're very helpful that way. So now remember that admissions and departments don't really communicate. So just because you talk to a lovely person in whatever department, they don't it would be in rare circumstances that that's going to have a big impact on your admission. So we're not saying talk, go, everyone needs to go talk to the departments to show demonstrated interest. We're saying in order to help you make the best informed decisions, you want to do that, especially when we can't be visiting college campuses right now. Great. Um, we're about to wrap up, but Jillian, are there any questions related to the programs at UT? Yes. Um... Is the resume, the expanded resume, any different if you're applying for an honors program? No, it's the exact same resume. Now, the one thing I will say, if you're applying to plan two, and I think this may just be plan two students, sometimes I notice the plan two students' essays are a little longer. I don't think it means you need to have a longer essay to get into plan two. I just think those students tend to have really interesting topics that sometimes go on a little longer. Um, but no, everything is the same and everything in your application, this is important to understand, is considered, they're considering when they're considering you for honors. Do you see what I'm saying? So even though they've got the short little question for their, their little part, everything is, is considered. So the whole thing's got to kind of hold like that. Mm -hmm. um, are the classes smaller in the honors mm -hmm. program? Typically they are. Would that be a good question to talk to them about? Mm -hmm. Definitely. And especially post COVID, not sure how that's going to look, right? But that is, I mean, in plan two specifically, that's typically how it is. Um, a couple more questions. Um, one is about should a student use additional information to explain how ADHD impacted their academic journey, especially if they have an upward trend in their grades during, due to figuring out how to cope with it? Absolutely, yes. 
Absolutely. Anything where something has been an obstacle and you have gotten, you know, you've moved forward on it. Absolutely. Yes. Another question about honors. The College of Science has three honors programs. If applying to more than one or all three, do you need to write different essays? For the College of Natural Sciences, um, do you have to pick one? Pick one of the honors programs. And then you will write an essay specific for that, specifically for that program that's actually embedded within the Apply Texas application. And then Bob, go for it. Yeah, so um, yesterday the Apply Texas application opened for the University of Texas at Austin. Now, we want to encourage every student that first isn't best, that in fact, University of Texas at Austin has a priority deadline of November 1st, and that priority deadline assures students that they will hear earlier than if they apply regular decision. As a result, our strong counsel to students is they should apply to the University of Texas when they feel like their story and all components of their application are compelling, and that a mad rush is your enemy. An attempt to somehow get it in tomorrow by 12 o'clock or next Tuesday or next Wednesday or next Thursday because a friend of yours told you that they already got their application in only increases your stress and reduces the quality of your application. Work methodically through this step by step. Work in tandem with the process that your high school has laid out in terms of requesting transcripts, in terms of requesting letters of rec, but the best applications to the University of Texas at Austin are done methodically and they're done holistically. Allison, you've worked with countless students on their Apply Texas application. Are there any common mistakes that are made that you'd encourage people to keep an eye out for? Absolutely. Um, number one, um, the Apply Texas application isn't the most modern format. So, it doesn't auto save. So um, make sure you hit the save button early and often because um, it is mildly tragic when it, um, when it eats all your information. So just, you know, the common app auto saves, Apply Texas did not. So save early and often. Um, the next piece I would say is sometimes when you get to the activities section, there's a box that says, um, check this box if you'll be submitting an additional resume. For UT Austin, check that box. Um, but that does not exempt you from having to fill out the activity descriptions beneath that box. It's a both and. So check the resume box and then use the information from your resume to fill out those um, activity descriptions that are beneath that in that same section. Um, in Terrific. addition, one last thing, they do ask for your social security number and we do recommend including it um, as it is in important piece in tracking your application. And one question that just came up that I see on, on one of the chats that I think is a really great question is what if my student reads like say they read like business but they're applying to communications okay there's actually a fair amount of overlap between students who are going to apply to one thing over the other so like if they have a lot of business experience but they're reading communications that's where the essay becomes your glue okay and explaining why you want to do why you want to approach for example in this case business as from a communication standpoint so because that's that's going to happen to a lot of students where it's like you read it and you're like eh, well it reads a little bit like this or this that's where that major essay you want to make sure you answered the question about um why i want to major in this if if there can be some question, but there's always overlap in all these things. So don't, while we're saying fit to major is important. I mean, most of the kids coming out of the business school in this modern day are going to work in business. And a lot of them go in with business. It's just that they want to approach it from a communication angle. So, um, but that, that happens in a number of majors. So I just wanted to point that out because yeah. Jillian, are there any questions that have come up regarding the Apply Texas application? Yeah, Allison. Uh, quick, oh, go ahead. The question. No, go ahead, Allison. The, the quick point is the um, Apply Texas submitting the Apply Texas application for UT is actually a two-step process. So you submit your application, 
but then you still need to upload your resume. That doesn't happen in the same moment that you submit your application. So what happens, and they, they, they explain this when you submit, but just to make sure, um, because it isn't intuitive, is once you submit your application, they send the student um, what's called their UTEID, so their, their electronic ID number, that then gives them access to the student portal. That student portal is where they're going to upload their resume, their expanded resume, and also either upload letters of rec or invite their recommenders to um, upload the letters of recommendation. So those are both both of those pieces are are crucial, and your application is not considered complete without it. And so make sure you do the two steps of the application process. Very important. Thank you. And one thing we didn't mention, kind of, especially given COVID, many students have things that they're getting ready to do because they are, um, because they're, you know, Austin may open up more and so they may be doing an internship or, you know, you can put anything on your resume that you're planning on doing going forward. So it doesn't have to be something that you're doing, um, that you're doing only, um, that you've already done. So you're okay to put things that are going forward for sure. So that's not an issue at all. Lisa, is there any advantage to using Apply Texas over the coalition application? Absolutely. Number one, the, Allison, I'm gonna let you take this one. <laughs> Number one, the coalition application um, isn't very friendly. Um, it's, just, it's, it's a little challenging to do, it's not very intuitive. Um, the Apply Texas application, um, they use it a lot of big public schools in Texas, so you can use it typically in a lot more situations than you can the coalition. Um, and in the application world, um, it's a little easier to fill out Apply Texas from that expanded resume than it is to fill out the coalition application with the expanded resume. I would say. And I would say readers are reading for Texas, because remember there's tons of readers all over the country okay so this is not you know somebody over at the office in austin is reading your application and knows everything about you right so important is it's much easier for the reader because they're so much more easy they're used to the apply texas they get very few coalition applications so i personally think you want to stick with apply texas yeah even though it's a lot of work and do you have any information about UT anticipating more or less um, applicants this year? I think that is the $50 million question. Um, there's absolutely no way there's a, you know, some people think UT is going to be a lot harder to get into this year because a lot of people want to go to state schools. Some people think, no, maybe it'll be easier. I don't think that we can really predict that. I think what we can predict is do the best application that represents your student. We've given you a lot of information here. What I wanna say is you're not gonna have a perfect application. Every student doesn't check every single box perfectly. So we're giving you kind of best case scenario. You have to adapt that to your student and your situation, especially given the fact that we've been in an especially difficult time. So I don't want this to raise anxiety for you, but to, um, to you know, give you as much information as possible. Um, Jillian will be sharing the link for our updated guide to applying to the University of Texas at Austin. Um, we really have appreciated everyone joining us this evening. Um, as we said at the beginning, UT Austin is a spectacular school that for the right student uh, affords a whole host of opportunities. We hope that you and your students step through this process with as little stress as you possibly can. And we it, wish you all well, both in the application process and then as your student ultimately moves on to college. Thanks so much and have a great evening.